you will see there is a logo in the corner of this slide, MacArthur Green. Uh, that's just to remind me to say that uh, as well as being involved with SNH and University of Glasgow, I also work part-time as a consultant for MacArthur Green, uh, particularly on um, offshore wind farms and their impacts on seabirds. So. I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the international importance of Scottish seabirds, then their um, role as a monitor of pollutants and as a monitor of fisheries, and then consider the main things that are causing our populations of seabirds to change, uh, and then to look at offshore wind farms in particular in that context, and then finish up by looking at a strategy for seabird conservation. You might think that we'd already have a strategy for seabird conservation, but rather surprisingly, we're only just now starting to develop one, uh, which is a little bit late in the day. So the international context, um, Scotland has some of the largest seabird populations of Europe. Uh, the Bass Rock, for example, is the world's biggest gannet colony. Um, Scotland has more than 60% um, of the entire world population of gannets breeding in Scotland. Uh, we've also got a high proportion of several other seabird species. We've got uh, more than half of the world's great skewers, which are particularly nice seabirds. Uh, we've got very large numbers of many other species. So we have a huge international responsibility. Uh, we could say that seabirds are, are one of the things that Scotland really is... Um, most endowed with. The other thing about seabirds is that they tend to be in really nice places. So they're attractive places to visit and to do research. Um, this is the cliff on the north bank of Fula in Shetland. Um, a huge seabird population, but actually not mostly on that cliff. Uh, most of the seabirds are around the other side of the island where the cliff breaks away and forms boulder fields and they tend to nest in amongst all the boulder fields, uh, which has the advantage that they can actually be quite accessible as well. Uh, most of you probably know that um, our seabird populations are currently in some trouble. Um, the populations over the last 20 or 30 years have mostly been declining. And so there's a huge conservation issue with our seabirds. And you'll see that the declines of some species are really dramatic. So 66% decline in kittiwake breeding numbers in Scotland between 1986 and 2011. Since then, that decline has continued, and the other declines have continued, and so the situation now is undoubtedly worse than this table suggests. But we don't quite know exactly where we stand at the moment because there hasn't been a national census of our seabirds for quite a long time. There is one currently taking place at the moment, but it hasn't been very well funded, and the results <laughs> are not yet available for most species, so we don't quite know where we stand. There are various monitoring programs, but the monitoring counts don't necessarily tell you exactly what's happening at a national level. Monitoring tends to focus on some of the large colonies, and the dynamics of large colonies are different from the dynamics of small colonies. And so there's quite a lot of evidence that large colonies are currently declining faster than small colonies are. And in some species, small colonies are actually increasing in size, while the large colonies are declining. So Getting the national picture is actually quite difficult on the basis of the monitoring data we have. The um, census that's going on at the moment, I think, will confirm what we suspect, that there's been huge declines in most of our seabirds, with the exception of gannet, the one species that has continued to increase. The fact that we know so much about our seabirds uh, is something we kind of take for granted in, in Britain. In 1969, there was a complete census of all the breeding seabirds in Britain and Ireland, and that was the first national census of seabirds anywhere in the world. It was organized mainly by Bill Bourne uh, through the Seabird Group, which he set up, um, and it, it took thousands of people 
to do the survey and they were mostly amateurs organized by an amateur and it's a fantastic resource for us to have this national census the 1969 census was repeated again uh, so we've had three censuses now at roughly 15 year intervals which gives us a, a very very comprehensive picture of the changes in our seabird populations far better than for most other parts of the world uh, and that I'm kind of stressing the fact that this was done by amateurs because I think that's a really important fact that we do have this enormous resource in Britain of keen amateurs who are really competent at doing this kind of census work and one of the things that you can do with the data is to have a look at the spatial distribution of seabird colonies and what that might tell you and this graph shows the numbers of pairs of puffins in a particular colony plotted against the number of pairs of puffins in other colonies within the foraging range of that individual colony so each dot there represents one colony the y-axis is the size of that colony <coughs> the x-axis is the number of pairs breeding in other colonies within foraging range if you're really on the ball you'll see it's a square root <coughs> plot against a square root and that's to do with the fact that these birds are central place foragers which are radiating out from a central place over an area of sea and what this graph is doing is it's looking at whether or not there's an interaction between neighboring colonies now when I was a student I was told that there's a lot of fish in the sea and there's no way that seabirds can be depleting their food supply and therefore there can't be a density dependent process going on regulating the size of seabird populations it's got to be something else but when you look at this graph if those colony sizes were randomly distributed the dots would be all over the graph and they're actually almost in a straight line and the straight line implies that the more puffins there are in other colonies nearby the smaller the size of your colony so this is clear evidence for density dependent competition presumably for food in the vicinity of colonies and it works for puffin but it works for gannet and it also works for two other species we looked at in detail kittiwake and shag uh, and Tim Burke and I got a nice paper in nature out of this but it's all thanks to the efforts of the amateurs who went and counted the numbers of pairs of all these birds in all these colonies and all Tim and I did was take the data and plot graphs from it um, so two messages here one is the huge resource we have of very detailed information on the sizes of our seabird colonies and the other is the thanks to amateurs who essentially were responsible for collecting all of those data but this was the beginning of a change in the attitude to seabird fishery interactions which led us into the idea that in fact there's intense competition for food around seabird colonies these birds are um, having to travel further from the colony where the colonies are larger in order to find resources and when now from tracking studies and from a number of other studies we know that the larger the colony the further the birds have to go to look for food so there are many layers of, of evidence for density dependent competition for food around seabird colonies now to turn to seabirds as monitors of pollutants uh, there's been a long-standing use of seabirds to look at marine pollutants originally many of the studies involved shooting seabirds and cutting out their livers and kidneys because those are the organs that pollutants are concentrated in but of course things have moved on and we now don't need to kill the birds and one of the first steps in that direction was to use eggs to monitor pollutants very convenient to sample eggs from <coughs> colonies don't worry about the details in this graph they're totally irrelevant all that they will show you is that there's been a huge change in the concentration of persistent organic pollutants in the eggs of these birds they happen to be great skewers from Shetland but you'll see on the left hand side of the graph there are open circles on the right hand side of the graph there are closed circles and those dots represent eggs that were sampled in 1980 and in 2008 and in all cases the pollutant levels were much lower in 2008 than they were in the 1980s so these eggs are giving evidence of a reduction in 
the concentrations of legacy pollutants, things like PCBs and deodron and DDT uh, in the marine environment. And this bird, the great skew, is a top predator. It was selected because it's at the top of the food chain and so it, it accumulates high levels of these pollutants. So eggs are a convenient way of sampling to look at marine pollutants in, in seabirds. But you can do more. You can take feathers. And some pollutants, not all, are um, ex excreted into feathers as the feathers grow. And in particular, mercury, uh, methyl mercury, which is the highly toxic form of mercury, is incorporated into the keratin of feathers as the feathers grow. And birds use the molting process to get rid of the mercury that's in their soft tissues. And if you take feather samples and you compare birds from the museums uh, that were collected in the 1880s and 1890s with present day birds, you can see the increase that's occurred in mercury levels in these birds over the last 100 to 150 years. And this kind of example um, is, is replicated over many different species. There's huge individual variation in the concentrations of mercury, but there's clear evidence that these mercury levels have increased over time. Uh, this happens to be for one of the seabirds in Scotland, but it's this kind of analysis has now been done for lots of different seabird species in different parts of the world. And one of the interesting features of this is that the concentrations of mercury in these seabirds are considerably higher than the concentrations of mercury that will have <laughs> lethal effects in birds of prey. So that, for example, white-tailed eagles and other seabirds show reproductive failure at mercury concentrations that are quite a lot lower than the levels found in seabirds. And so seabirds seem to be particularly tolerant of these high levels of mercury. And in fact, the same thing is true of persistent organic pollutants that um, birds of prey are much more sensitive to toxic effects from those than seabirds are. And you can now do some quite clever things w if you track seabirds and find out where they go to spend the winter. And this slide is based on a study that was done a few years ago looking at great skewer migrations. And the birds were tracked by putting geolocator tags onto leg rings to find out where they spend the winter. And we were working on three different populations, one on Bear Island, Bjornaya, one in Iceland, and one in Shetland. Those are the three stars on the map. And we found that those birds go to three different wintering areas. Some of them go to the Grand Banks, some winter around the British Isles, and some winter off Africa. And it's not that all the birds from one population go to one of those wintering areas. They kind of mix up. In, as it happens, the Shetland birds, none of them go to America. But some of the Shetland birds winter in Europe, most of them winter in Africa. Some of the Icelandic and some of the Bear Island birds go to each of those three wintering areas. But we then caught those birds on the nest when they were back at the colony and sampled their blood and looked at stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. And this graph shows the wintering locations of <coughs> different individual birds. Each dot there is an individual bird. The um, heavy symbols are birds that we tracked with geolocators. And you can see that there are three clusters. They're labeled green, blue, and red in this graph. And there is essentially no overlap between those three clusters of birds in terms of their carbon and nitrogen isotope signals and in relation to where the geolocators told us they wintered. So we've got very good classification of the wintering areas of these birds just from the isotopes. So we know where they went because some of them had geolocators on. But now that we've shown that the isotopic signature of the birds differs according to where they winter, we can use that isotopic signature to identify where the birds spend the winter and then look at the pollutants in their blood and relate that to where they spent the winter. And in fact, there are differences in the blood pollutant concentrations and the ratios of different pollutants in these birds on the basis of where their wintering area is. So some of the pollutants they're probably picking up during the breeding season, but some of the pollutants they're clearly picking up in the wintering area and then bringing back to the colony. And those levels are then uh, potentially getting into their eggs and their chicks 
uh, and so could be having effects on the birds. And we tried very, very hard to detect adverse effects of pollutants on these seabirds. Great skills have the highest levels of persistent organic pollutants of any seabirds in the North Atlantic. And we did find some evidence of a harmful effect, and that's shown in this graph, which shows the growth rate of the second chick. Skios have two chicks, and they hatch asynchronously, and the second chick's a bit younger, and so it gets beaten up by its older sibling, and it only survives if there's plenty of food. And the growth rate of the second chick is therefore quite sensitive to the environmental conditions, but it's also related here to the concentrations of persistent organic pollutants in the blood of the female. So birds with higher concentrations of persistent organic pollutants in their plasma have chicks that grew at a slower rate, which could be consistent with the pollutants having an adverse effect, uh, but it could simply be a correlation. So it's not clear that this is a causal relationship, and in fact there may well be other reasons for this correlation rather than it being a causal relationship. So there is very little evidence that these contaminants are having a harmful effect on the seabirds. And what evidence there is doesn't prove that it's a direct causal relationship. It may simply be a correlation. What we did find, though, is that there's huge variation in the concentrations of these persistent organic pollutants between Bear Island, Iceland, and Shetland. And actually, we did originally imagine that the further you go away from sources of these pollutants, the lower the concentrations might be. So we'd expected Bear Island would be the cleanest of the three sites. And it actually turned out to be the other way around. The skewers on Bear Island have the highest concentrations. And that's partly because the um, skewers on Bear Island are more predatory, and so they're actually eating mainly fulmers and kittiwakes and other seabirds, whereas the skewers in Shetland are mostly eating sand eels and so they're at a lower trophic level. Um, but it's possibly also partly to do with the fact that these pollutants are transported in the atmosphere, and they then condense in cold conditions and get into the food chain. And so there may be more condensation of these persistent organic pollutants in the high Arctic, in the cold atmospheric conditions, which means that they build up more in the um, the ecosystem there than they do in places like Shetland. So some quite interesting information from looking at these seabirds as to what pollutants they have, where they get them from, um, but very little evidence of any toxic effects on the birds. And certainly the legacy pollutants are now declining in concentration, although there are some new things which are turning up in some of these um, as well. So there is great potential for using seabirds as monitors of pollutants. But they're also quite strong indicators of the state of small fish stocks in their environment. And this again comes back to density dependence and the role of food abundance on the breeding success and survival of seabirds. And this was the first analysis that was done looking at the relationship between seabird breeding success and sand eel stocks. And this is data for Shetland, looking at the breeding success of kittiwakes <laughs> in relation to the estimated biomass of sand eels at Shetland. And you can see there's a huge scatter in the data, so it's not a very strong relationship, but actually the R-squared is 63% of the variance explained by the relationship, so that's pretty good for ecology. And you can see that when the sand eel stock falls below a certain threshold level, the breeding success of the kittiwakes goes down rather dramatically. So it doesn't really bother the kittiwakes whether there's 60,000 tons or 150,000 tons. That's plenty. But when the biomass of the sand eel stock goes down below about 40 or 50,000 tons, it gets difficult for the kittiwakes. Now, kittiwakes don't consume 40 or 50,000 tons of sand eels in Shetland. So they're not eating all these sand eels. The relationship comes about because they need a certain density of fish in the sea in order to be able to forage economically. 
So it's the density of the prey that is driving the, the breeding success of kittiwakes. <coughs> that would be fine if it wasn't for the fact that we are harvesting sand eels and there is now strong evidence that sand eel fishing reduces the stock size of sand eels. Mm -hmm. And so our targeted fisheries for sand eels are causing reduced breeding success in kittiwakes to some extent in other seabirds. And by far the best example of this is work done by CEH, uh, specifically by Morton Fredrickson on the Isle of May. And he showed that kittiwake breeding success on the Isle of May, and each dot here represents one different year, uh, is not only related to um, sea surface temperature, so that the warmer the sea surface temperature, the lower the breeding success, but there's also a relationship with the presence or absence of a sand eel fishery off East Scotland. And the solid dots are the years in which there was no sand eel fishery off the east of Scotland, and the open circles are the years when there was a sand eel fishery going on. And you can see there are two relationships. The solid line is the regression against sea surface temperature when there's no sand eel fishery, and the dotted line is the same regression when there is a sand eel fishery, and those two lines are parallel. So what that says is that when you have a sand eel fishery, you reduce the breeding success of kittiwakes. But the kittiwake breeding success is also influenced by sea surface temperature. So there's evidence here for a climate change e effect on kittiwakes, as well as an effect of the sand eel fishery. And the belief is that the sea surface temperature relationship comes about because sand eels have a higher reproductive success in colder years. So temperature of the sea influences probably the survival of sand eel larvae, but possibly also the production of eggs. And it also influences the timing of, of reproduction of sand eels. So climate change clearly is a major potential influence here but the fishery is too. And you can see from this graph, you can do a back of the envelope calculation of how many kittiwakes are we losing from the population when there is a sand eel fishery off the east of Scotland, because that is the difference between the position on those two parallel lines. And if you do that, it's quite worrying. It is tens of thousands of kittiwake chicks per year which are being lost from the population if there is a sand eel fishery relative to the condition when there's no fishery. And more recently, Matthew Carroll and colleagues in the RSPB, um, together with myself, have looked at the situation for the Dogger Bank. Now, the Shetland sand eel stock is different from the east of Scotland sand eel stock, and that is different from the Dogger Bank sand eel stock. When the relationship was found for the east of Scotland, because of the low breeding success of kittiwakes, a closed area was put into effect by ICES, uh, which stopped sand eel fishing close to the Isle of May, and the breeding success of the kittiwakes improved, and the sand eel abundance improved as a result of that fishery closure, and that fishery closure is still in effect. Almost all the Danish sand eel fishery is now going on on the Dogger Bank, and this graph shows a relationship between kittiwake breeding success at Flamborough and Filey, uh, at Bempton Cliffs. Uh, Flamborough and Filey mm -hmm. SPA is the biggest kittiwake colony in the British Isles. And these birds go out to the Dogger Bank and um, the breeding success of the kittiwakes at this colony correlates with the fishing mortality imposed on the stock by the Danish sand eel fishery. So that where the fishing mortality is higher, the subsequent breeding success of kittiwakes is reduced. And again, we're talking about thousands per year being lost from the population as a result of high fishing mortality. And recently a paper was published by the Danish fishery people uh, which actually carried out simulations, scenario testing, looking at what would have happened to the sand eel stock on the Dogger Bank if the fishing mortality had been lower than it actually has been. And the answer, of course, is that the sand eel stock would have been bigger. And, and if the fishing mortality had only been about half what it has been historically, there would probably be twice the biomass of, of sand eels on the Dogger Bank as there is now. So there's strong evidence here that the fishery is the cause, 
of a reduction in sand eel biomass, and that reduction in sand eel biomass has a strong influence on kittiwake breeding success. Now the evidence is that it doesn't have such a strong influence on other seabirds. Kittiwakes are the most severely affected, partly because they can only feed at the sea surface, whereas things like guillemots and razorbills can dive down to the seabed searching for fish. So they have more opportunity to find sand eels even when the sand eel abundance is relatively low. And it's the surface feeding seabirds that appear to be most sensitive, kittiwakes, but also arctic terns, common terns, um, and some of the other seabirds <coughs> are, are relatively unaffected. So the response of species of seabirds is very variable depending on their ecology, and the kittiwake is the one that we have the best for. You can actually use seabirds, though, to monitor other aspects of fisheries. And this graph looks at a relationship between great skewers in Shetland and discarding by the trawl fishery in the northern North Sea. The trawl fishery discards large quantities of haddock and whiting. And these two graphs show the, um, dis the quantities of haddock and whiting being discarded and the proportion of the great skewer diet composed of haddock and whiting during the breeding season. Now there's a remarkably high correlation between those two pairs of lines. And we didn't look at this correlation until the very end of this, um, after 2002, when we'd been monitoring the diet of these birds for about 20 years. <clears throat> and then I suddenly realized that we could go to ICES and we could get the data on discards. To be fair, earlier on, the data on discards had been kind of secret because the fishing industry didn't want to say too much about how much they were throwing away. Eventually it became more public and we were able to access the data and look at the correlation. And we were staggered at how close the relationship was here between the amounts being discarded by the fishing fleet and the composition of the diet of these birds. What it says is that great skewers do a lot of their foraging by going out to fishing boats around Shetland and following them and picking up whatever they happen to be discarding. And if it's haddock, they eat haddock, and if it's whiting, they eat whiting. They don't care which it is. So they're reflecting the composition of the discards from the fishing fleet. Um, and recently there's been a paper published actually in, in Spain suggesting that you could use the pellets regurgitated by gulls to monitor the uh, landings obligation, the EU landings obligation, which says there shall be no discarding. Well, haddock and whiting are bottom living fish. Great skewers can't feed on haddock and whiting naturally because they're at the bottom of the sea and the great skewers are at the top. So there's no way that they can access these fish except when they're discarded by the trawl fishery. So you can use seabirds to identify whether any of these bottom living fish are being discarded because that's the only way they can be in their diet. Uh, the photo on the top right there is a, a bonksy pellet and in that pellet there are fish bones and the one that we use to identify the fish is the otolith which is the bone from the inner ear of the fish um, which tells you the species of fish, it also tells you the size of the fish and the age of the fish. Uh, and you can also see there's an arctic turn beak in there, so that was a very naughty bonksy. <laughs> so the main drivers of decline of our seabirds, one of them is fisheries. Depleting stocks of sand eels has clearly had an adverse effect on kittiwakes and other seabirds. <laughs> Paradoxically, reducing discarding has had an adverse effect on scavenging seabirds, which includes great black back gull, herring gull, lesser black back gull, kittiwake, as well as great skewer. All those species have struggled because they can't now just go and follow fishing boats and get lots of food because there's much less being discarded. Now that's obviously a good thing. We don't want to discard fish. There is no sense in discarding it, but it does have an, a consequence for seabird populations. And a further consequence is that great skewers and great black back gulls, because they're short of food, have to switch to other feeding techniques and those include killing and eating arctic terns, puffins, and kittiwakes. So there's a knock-on effect to smaller seabirds because larger seabirds are having to switch to predation. There's evidence that climate change 
clearly has indirect effects on seabirds as a result of changing marine ecosystems, changes in the copepods in the North Sea, changes in sand deal productivity. <laughs> but there are also some lines of evidence that there can be direct effects of um, climate change on seabirds. Several of our seabirds are Arctic species, which are at the southern edge of their breeding range in Scotland, like the Arctic skewer. Arctic skewers have declined dramatically. They're now red listed. And there's quite a lot of evidence that that decline includes the consequence of warmer conditions being unfavorable for those birds when they're breeding. And the really crucial one that we tend to forget about is the effect of invasive alien mammals. Lots of our Scottish islands have got rats and lots of them have got feral cats, and some of them have got other predators too. And we've kind of got used to that. But if you think about how it used to be, it was very different. Almost all of Shetland is now infested with rats. So there are very few places where storm petrels can breed. The only storm petrel colonies in Shetland are on the remote places that don't have rats. There's an awful lot we could do by eradicating rats and making it possible for these seabirds to breed on islands that are currently impossible because of predators. And a lot of people think pollutants are a major problem, including plastics, and seabirds do ingest plastics, but actually there's very little evidence of harmful effects at a population level. Of course, one or two birds will die as a result of ingested plastic or getting tangled in netting, but at a population level, that seems to be a really minor influence and as I said, mercury and, and persistent organic pollutants seem to be less of an influence than we might have imagined. And even oil pollution has had relatively little impact at the population level. So that leaves us with offshore wind turbines, and I'm going to be very brief. But of course, we know there's a huge increase in offshore wind production. That map shows sites where <coughs> offshore wind is now... Um, operational or likely to be very soon. And you'll see a huge concentration in the southern North Sea. <coughs> so this is a huge population uh, problem for natural England, much more so than it is yet for SNH. But of course, our seabirds, a lot of them migrate south through the southern North Sea. So our guillemots and razorbills go down there to winter, and our gannets migrate past there on their way to Africa. So they're at risk of collision and displacement. And the big concerns are collision risk and displacement impacts. And it's the cumulative impacts of all of these sites together, which is the big concern. We can do collision risk modeling, um, but the models are very precautionary. And so they tend to overestimate the likely impact. And it's very difficult to uh, avoid having to end up with a very precautionary assessment. In the case of displacement, we know that red-throated divers, guillemots, and razorbills are displaced by offshore wind farms. But we have very little idea of what the impact of that displacement is for the population. Does it matter if they're displaced? And we also have relatively little information on which populations are at risk. And some seabirds actually benefit from offshore wind farms. Cormorants and shags are now moving out from the coast to offshore areas to forage, areas that they couldn't have used in the past because they have wettable plumage. They can't go far out to sea and stay out there. But if they go out to an offshore wind farm, they can sit on the structures and dry themselves. And that expands their foraging opportunities out into the sea. So they're benefiting. Most seabirds are very good at avoiding turbines. This is a radar study of the movements of seabirds through one particular wind farm. And you can see the way they don't go into the wind farm much, but if they do, they go down the rows between the turbines. So the risk may be less than feared. <coughs> we currently have a project funded by Vattenfall through the um, Aberdeen offshore wind farm, looking at guillemots and razor, which are two of the species that are used. And we're tagging these birds with geolocators attached to leg rings. The geolocator measures light intensity, and you can use that to identify the latitude and longitude of the bird. <coughs> and we now have some good data coming in on the movements of these birds. So here's a couple of graphs showing examples of that. On the left-hand side are guillemots from Canna, <coughs> and the blue lines show the um, 50 and 
90% kernel density distributions of those birds around Cana through the non-breeding period. And on the right-hand side, the same thing for Fula. And you can see that the Cana birds tend to stay in the west of Scotland. The Shetland birds tend to stay in the northern North Sea. There's a little bit of movement beyond. <coughs> but what we found is that razorbills from all of the colonies in Scotland tend to go to the southern North Sea, exactly where all these wind farms are. So our razorbills from all over Scotland seem to be at risk of displacement from offshore wind farms in the southern North Sea. <coughs> but we don't yet know whether that is of any consequence at a population level. Does it actually matter that they're displaced? So we have a conservation strategy which is developing, and one of the aims of that is to fill key evidence gaps. And there's quite a lot of new technology available now to, to do that, such as GPS tracking and geolocators. And we ought to be thinking in terms of what actions can we take to mitigate the worst impacts, but also are there possibilities for compensation? And if we get into the concept of biodiversity net gain, then clearly things like eradicating rats from islands is highly beneficial for seabirds, but not necessarily the same species that are at risk from uh, sand eel fishing or um, offshore wind farms. So it then raises a question of what would be the best value for money actions that we could take to conserve seabirds. And these birds are very mobile, of course, and so protected areas is probably not the best way to go. We're talking here about um, North Sea wide approaches and things like um, regulating sand eel fishing would seem to be a more appropriate approach. So I'll finish with a picture of a puffin because everybody loves puffins <laughs> um, and <coughs> summarize what I've said there and maybe leave that up in case that helps people to think of anything they want to question. Sorry, I'll leave it.